Let's storm a Kaaba. I don't know dear reader who you are, what stage of life might this be? And how much have you experienced I wonder our lives and the life of the world around us, then I don't know about you what is more important to me than all of that, which is your position on what I write if you continue reading it, are you in the position of accepting or in the position of rejecting, even the letters I receive from readers do not tell me much of what I now want to know, because they are messages that reflect different directions, the seven different spectra of light, after penetrating a piece of crystal, so where do you dear readers stand regarding those spectra, that's what I don't know, However, I address the letter to you, because if I am ignorant of everything you mentioned, then I am certain that you must have learned about me from what you have read to me, that I say what I believe to be the truth, and I do not flatter anyone, or if you want a truer and more accurate statement, say I do not flatter anyone except, with the minimum courtesy, which is the minimum required of me as a member of a society, and on this basis alone, I have given my pen permission to present these pages to you, with all their boldness and frankness, if they do not find acceptance and satisfaction with you, then at least they will receive your pardon, and forgiveness for Egypt is the fate of all of us alike, it is enough for an Egyptian to be sincere in his words and sincere in his advice, so what if the sincere and honest Egyptian has reached the age I have reached, and he has the right to reveal what is in his soul before the curtain comes down, perhaps I would do well if I began with what should have been the conclusion, which is that to this day, we have not yet entered into the civilization and culture of the 20th century even though at the time of writing these lines, only 17 years remain of it, and I wish we could enter into it from its last years, when the world closes the doors, you enter a new phase, it is enough for us to enter from where they leave, and to begin a path that they have finished, folded, and finished for something else, but how did all this happen to us, and why, if there is an obstacle in our way, what is it, what prevents them from being stormed to open the way, accompany me, dear reader, and we will move together step by step, until the whiteness of truth becomes clear from the blackness of falsehood, and I will refer every step we take together to your mind, your heart, and your conscience. I will appeal to your mind whenever we extract a conclusion from the data in our hands, hoping that you will not be one of those who acknowledge that the data is such and such, so that when they see the result that results from that data, they become terrified and flee. I will appeal to your heart from the point of view that you and I are Egyptians. Our hearts are filled with love for Egypt and hope for its prosperity, so that we cannot remain silent about the obstacles that we see thrown in its path to prevent it from moving forward, after this and that, I will appeal to your conscience, because it is the court that lies within your wings to judge for you or against you, your mind may see the right opinion, and your heart may beat in sympathy with what the mind thought, and yet you freeze in your place, neither moving nor moving, then the spur of a living conscience will come to push you to do your duty, the first step on our path is to place our fingers on the key to the era that we called the 20th century, and of which I claim that we have not crossed its threshold to enter its scope even though it has approached its end. I say that the first step is to find the key of the era, because I know how much we deceive, or say how much we deceive ourselves, with what we are in. We imagine, or we deceive people, that we have reached our zenith, and the problem here is that we confuse what is old glory, with what should have been new glory. However, on top of that reason, there is another reason that is more intractable, which is that a huge number of our opinionated people do not know either a little or a lot about the spirit of our time. In addition to the two reasons, there is a third reason that leads us to the state of self-deception in which we live, which is that we look at our lives. We find on its square all kinds of machines and devices that our era is known for. So we think that we have entered the era from its whitest gates, as long as cars fill the streets, televisions, refrigerators, and various electrical appliances fill homes, airplanes roar in the air of the sky, and factories on our land take shapes and colors, and we forget the truth. It is clearer than the sun on a summer noon, that it was all done by someone else, and that the sciences embodied in it are the sciences of others, and that our role is no more than buying what others have made, and memorizing by heart. If we have memorized the knowledge that others have achieved, all three of these ills come together in our hearts. So we are deceived into thinking that we truly belong to the 20th century, in terms of civilization, science, and culture, but we are not. In order to clarify the truth of the matter, we must search in this era for its key to see if that key is in our hands, or is it something that has not yet entered our minds, and perhaps if we knew it, we would deny it and reject it. As for that key, as I see it and you have the right to reject the opinion and search for another key for us, if you can that key is that the leading countries in the civilization and culture of the era have replaced the old way of reading the universe and its beings with another new way 
and the results that were were incomparable. It falls under limitation. As for reading the universe in the old way, it saw the universe in terms of its being a whole, and saw in any of its beings, such as the sun, the moon, a tree, a river, and a single individual animal or human. I say that the old way of reading the universe and its beings is to see every being as having a self, a fixed identity. The beginning of the sun is a sun, the middle of it is a sun, and its end is a sun. The river that flows in our country was like this at the beginning of its era, in the middle of its era, and at the end of its era like, and you and I in this and that. Each of us has a fixed entity of identity from birth until he dies. Thus, what is said in this about the vocabulary of things, the same can be said about intangible beings as well. Pharaonic civilization, or Arab civilization, or the civilization of the contemporary West, and literature in each of its places, science and art, and the other members of this group of meanings, each of them is viewed as if it were an object. He has a fixed identity that occupies a specific place in a specific time. Philosophers of previous eras used to call the stability aspect of the identity of a particular thing essence. Therefore, we have the right to say that the key to the ancient vision was the implicit or explicit reference to the essence of the thing we are talking about, which guarantees that thing a fixed reality that it had yesterday, it has today, and will continue to have tomorrow and the day after. Before I extract from this old vision the result that interests me in this conversation, I would like to take the reader to the new vision, guided by which our era reads the truths of different things, in order to make it easier for the reader to compare the two visions, one with the other, and thus make it easier for him to trace the important results that result from what is between them. The two visions are different. As for this current era, in which we live from the end of the last century to the present day it bases its vision of the universe and its beings on the fact that everything is a biography, or it is history, or say that it is successive events in an uninterrupted line, as as if it were a chain in its links. The idea before that as we said was that everything has a fixed essence to which events occur, but in its essence, it does not change with those contingent events. As for the new idea about the specific thing, or about any living being, it is that it is these events themselves. Take an example that makes clear to you the difference between the two ideas, the city of Cairo. Because we use this name in a way that both the speaker and the listener understand as naming a specific city, our imagination is quick to imagine that that specific city is an entity that has existed since its establishment by al Muaz Li Din Allah, until today and beyond today. This constant presence of the city of Cairo would not have been achieved unless that city had an essential aspect that would not disappear with the years, despite what has happened to it, is still happening to it, and will continue to happen to it in terms of events. Its population increases and decreases and changes with death and birth, generation after generation, and its houses, streets, and shops are built and demolished. It expands and narrows until it can be said that there is not a single thing in Cairo today that remains the same as it was from al Muaz's Cairo, and yet it is Cairo. There is no explanation for such stability despite the changes that occur, except to say with the ancients, that it has a fixed essence, that gives it its fixed identity, then events come and go based on that essence, and Cairo remains with that essence. As for the vision of this era, it differs, because it is a vision that is only seen in Cairo as a long series of events, and nothing else. The alleged permanence is nothing but the permanence of the name only. The name Cairo is the only one that remains, so we imagine that its name exists as it has existed over the centuries. The truth about Cairo is that it is history, or it is a biography like any biography we tell about a person, a specific building, or whatever creatures you want. The reality of any being in this universe, and indeed the reality of the universe as a whole, is very similar to a piece of music, a play, or a movie. We refer to each of these things by a name that distinguishes them, so we say, for example, this is the Republican piece, and this is the play Scheherazade, and that is the movie Les Miserables, but each of these things is in reality a series of sound or light events, successive and interconnected with each other by links that make them unified in our minds in some way, which is what justifies us to give them one name, and then think that they are one partial. The transition of the 20th century and its people from seeing beings as constants with their permanent identities to seeing them as threads of successive events was the same as the transition from one intellectual era to another intellectual era. But what does all this matter to us? What concerns us is the following. The owner of the ancient vision was able to imagine the past as if it were like a ball that history could roll over the heads of the years, century after century, until it settled before our eyes as a present that we must deal with as people used to deal with 
it and what a long time ago, why not? It is the ball, it was, is, and will remain forever, and what changes is the groups of players, not the ball. I say that such a perception of the past in relation to the present and the future was possible and was even imposed on people, and it is a perception resulting from the point of view that was prevalent in people's understanding of the facts of things. If you told them for example an Arab civilization or an Arab culture, they would immediately respond. Their mind is an entity that has stability and permanence, thanks to its essence inherent in its foundations. As for the person with a contemporary outlook, if you say to him Arab civilization or Arab culture, a long line of successive events will be drawn in his mind. Arab civilization is history and not a fixed thing with its identity. If we are able to identify distinctive features of what we call Arab civilization or Arab culture, then those distinctive features are in the pattern of links with which events are linked in their succession and not in the essence of nothing. We have a trick on it, let us now look at the vast difference in our view of the past in relation to the present on the basis of the old vision and on the basis of the new vision. While in the first case we imagine the possibility of the past being resurrected in its entirety to be our present, in the second case we see that this is something of an impossibility. As long as it is a matter of a biography whose events follow the sequence of a story narrated by history, then the past has been completely swallowed up by the present and no longer has an independent existence, except in the sense that it is food that flows in our blood. If in the perception of the old vision, perfection was achieved in the lives of the ancestors, and we must bring it firmly into our era in order to live on its foundations as these ancestors did, then in the perception of the new vision, perfection will occur, and we must draw the steps with which we move toward towards that desire future goal. I want you dear reader to know that when we say the old vision and the new vision, we are not saying phrases that are nothing more than inscribed on paper or spoken in the mouths of speakers, but rather they are translated into living individuals with bodies of flesh and blood. They eat, drink, talk and laugh with you. When I claim to you at the beginning of the conversation that we have not yet stepped on the threshold of the 20th century even though it is a century approaching its end, I meant to say that if you carefully think about what most of the people of influential opinion in our lives say, you will find that it involves an assumption, and the assumption is that the past is a thing. It has a head, ears, eyes, tongue, lips, and legs on which it walks and runs, and this thing can walk to us today, coming from where I do not know. These people of opinion urge him to speed up his steps and come to dominate today if he can before tomorrow. Our salvation from all the problems we are immersed in depends on the arrival of that ghost, but they are waiting for the past to return to save them from what they are in, like those who were waiting for Goated. In Samuel Beckett's well-known play, Why? For a clear and simple reason, which is that the past was a page in a biography, it was a chapter in a history, and the page has been folded over which we have no help, and the historical chapter has come to an end, and we have no possibility of resurrecting it again, not because that past has ceased to exist, no, it is alive, but it is alive in us. It is alive in the Arabic language that we speak, it is alive in the basic rules of behavior in our dealings, it is alive in our conscience, the poet, who reads Al-Bukhari and becomes happy, and contemplates the Arabic art on the walls of mosques and becomes ecstatic. But our life is that which has completely digested the past and turned it into the secretions of glands and blood flowing in the arteries, but it is like any life in any living being a life moving in a current that constantly pushes it forward carrying within it what has been, heading towards achieving what will be. It is not more harmful to a person in his cultural and civilizational position than to emulate a historical stage that preceded the stage in which he lives in detail, letter by letter and action by action. Rather, it is not more harmful to the Salafi model itself than to have the successors continue to repeat and repeat it with such detailed simulation that we have referred to, for it is the heart and core of life. It is in her creativity of the new that she adapts to new situations. The secret of life, its magic, and its miracle is in its creativity. It is not limited to the fact that every living being has something that distinguishes it from all other beings, even those that fall into the same species with it, rather, this creative miracle extends to include aspects of intellectual life. It is enough for you to look at the creative power inherent in language and the ways we use it. Since the child picks up a few words and a few sentences, he takes on an innate ability to compose sentences in a way that he has not heard from anyone. The intended meaning can be put in different forms and the child does not have to hear it all from those around him. Rather, he is automatically capable of diversifying the linguistic structures that lead to the specific meaning that he wants to express. This is life and its nature at all its levels until it reaches the comprehensive civilizational level. I found him creating unprecedented images in all aspects of his life. 
Otherwise, stopping at the repetition the above is a harbinger of weakness, and weakness may have led to the extinction of a civilization that imitates its precedents, even if those precedents had reached their perfection at the time. Because that perfection itself, if its image is frozen, turns into a kind of deficiency. Every battle has its weapon, and the most perfect weapon in the battles of the past is the most incapable weapon in today's battles. If the difficult question posed to us to challenge our powers and abilities is, what is this insurmountable obstacle before which we stand unable to enter the 20th century with its waves, currents and transformations, even though this 20th century has approached its end for people to enter into another historical phase, then most likely it will come the most powerful wave, the most violent push, and the most intense transformation. We answered that this obstacle was to stop at a cultural and civilized pattern that we did not want to change with time, and we continued to go with it in the evening and in the morning until we satisfied it repeatedly and killed it by simulation and killing here in its literal sense and that life itself with its latent impulse, is about to shout at us and in us, let us all storm a Kaaba, aiming with its cry to innovate and not imitate.